Good evening. So we're going to be continuing in our fuel series as we focus uh, still this month and actually next month as well on igniting in the Word of God, igniting in His Bible. And uh, we have some outlines for you. If you didn't have an opportunity to get one of those on the way in, uh, raise your hand. Brad is saying, I'm just so ready to bring you an outline right now. So i got a couple hands that are raised there, Brad. People looking for that. I want to thank you for coming out here and being with us, especially those of you who are visiting. And um, what we have focused our time on this year is to try and grow and or ignite in our love for God, in our understanding of His Word, and in our walking in His kingdom. And so we have spent a considerable amount of time focusing this month on the Bible and igniting in our growing love for His Word. As we do that, we see that we need to spend time together studying that Word. And as individuals and as a congregation, we need to be both devoting time to reading, study, and, and spending time meditating upon what that, what that means and how that is applicable to the life that we live before Him. So last week we talked a little bit about how we receive the Word through inspiration. That is, it is the very Word of God but this week we are going to understand more about that. That it's also, it has been purposefully recorded. It is capable of revealing the mind to us. But so many people look at the Bible and they, they kind of get this picture that those who follow the Bible, those who are, a, a, that are led by it, are kind of like the people that play this right here. They're playing a game. Maybe some of you are familiar with this. One of Holly's favorite things to do while she's in Arizona is text me and go, have you played your Wordle yet? And then giggle whenever she just did it a lot faster than I did. People think that's what the Bible is. Just some, nothing more than another, a game or a, a, a fallacy or, or something that is just made up, an ancient myth full, full of false views and nonsense. As we examine this for a moment, what we are asking is, is this more than just a, a, a game to us? We come here to make believe, or have we come here to, to understand something about the Word of God? And one way that I believe we can begin to understand that is by answering this question that's on the board behind me. Can we trust this? What it is that we are going to spend our time studying this evening, can we trust the Word of God? That is to say, is it reliable? Is it something that dictates truth to us? And one of the, the great ways that we have sought to, to understand that is to see on a worldly level, is it historically accurate? Is it something that tells us about events that really happened? Is it something that describes to us things that occurred in reality in the time past? One of the reasons that's so important for us to understand is because there, there's a, a quote on your, on your handouts. If this is all a lie... If this is something that we could look back in history and see, these things didn't happen. These events that this Bible describes, they're, they're fictional. They're not based in any reality. Then no amount of theology, no amount of sincerity, no amount of time spent together in this church is going to make this anything more than a storybook. But if it is found to be true, it is found to be reliable and trustworthy, there is nothing that science or anything else can do to take away from the fact that this is a powerful documentation of God working in His world. And so I hope to spend a little bit of time focusing on that because the skeptical assessment of the Gospels is it was written hundreds of years later and merely paints Jesus and the God of the Bible as this divine but not historic picture of a man from Nazareth. And so how do you respond to that? Parents. How do you respond to it when your kids come to you and say, you know, my friend told me that this Bible, that the, what we've been reading, that they heard it was all made up. Or I went to school and my teacher told me that the, the things that were written about that, they happened many years later and there's no real evidence that any of it's even true. Your, parent, your kids have asked you that, parents. What do you respond? Do we have an answer? 
Because we need to have answers to these sorts of questions. And the good thing is God in His, in, in His divine providence has left us with answers. To be able to look at this and say, let's understand, can we trust what is written? Now before we begin, I think it's important to see that these skeptical observations, they're based, very often they're based on something that is not observable by evidence. Instead, what they're based on is presupposition, bias. I don't believe supernatural things can happen, so if it contains supernatural events, such as someone being raised from the dead, I'm just going to go ahead and discount it as not possible. There's not much we can do as we seek to try and change, uh, to, to show someone that the Bible is trustworthy if their biases won't allow them to recognize that. But I do want us to show that there are arguments and there are points that can be made that say this, what we hold in our hands, what we are reading, it is reliable historically. First, we need to get a few ground rules out of the way. Number one, we are not going to ignore facts. One of the biggest things that turns people off to the Bible and to Christianity is when you bring something up and say, explain this, and it just kind of gets pushed away or, 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 or explained away in some very quickly but, but doesn't really address it. If we go and stick our head in the sands, we're going to be doing a disservice to ourselves and to the people around us. So we're not going to ignore facts, even if they seem damaging. One argument that is often brought up against the reliability of the Bible is this one. Don't you know that the Bible was recorded through the nature of oral preservation. You know what that means? That means that it was passed down from generation to generation before it was recorded. Moses records, likely thousands of years later, what God inspired him to record, but that had been passed down by word of mouth from, from person to person. The, the gospel accounts are written by eyewitnesses, but many of these things were passed down, such as the gospel of Mark is being passed down from very likely Peter, to Mark. That's oral preservation. Can that really be trusted? Haven't you ever heard of the telephone game? And if you've heard of the telephone game, you know what I'm talking about. When you, you get a bunch of kids together, as we sometimes do, and you whisper in one of the kids' ear and see if they can get that phrase all the way around to the end. Maybe you whisper in their ear, pink platypuses eat pickled peppers. I don't even want to think about what that's going to turn into by the time it gets to the last person in that line. But here's where oral preservation is drastically different from the whisper or the telephone game. And that is in the very word whisper. The point of the game is to turn and quietly whisper to the person next to you so that nobody else hears it. And the whole point of that game is just to see, can we accurately preserve this message? But that's not how oral preservation occurs. Oral preservation occurs in groups, sometimes called ecclesias or churches, where someone would get up and recount the, the details of what happened. And they're doing it loud, and they're doing it with other people who have heard the same story, who have heard the same account, some of which were even there. And if you get a detail wrong, someone stands up and says, that's not right. And we talk about it and we figure it out because we are motivated to record what accurately happened. In fact, studies have shown that cultures that are steeped in oral preservation have shown themselves predominantly always to be able to accurately detail core elements of what it is they're trying to tell. Some language may change, but the core elements stay the same time and time again. So just because this was first orally passed down, that doesn't take away from its reliability. And that may be a fact that is about it, but we're not going to hide from that fact. Because there is evidence to say that that's still possible to preserve the nature of the message. So, number two, we are going to find historical reliability for the Bible the same way we find historical reliability for any other ancient document. And that means when someone says, how do you know the Bible can be trusted? What we cannot do is open up our Bibles to 1 Peter, which, which uh, Trevor read for us, 1 Peter, and go, because the Word of God endures forever. God said so. So the Bible can be trusted. That's not how we're going to show somebody the historical reliability of these ancient documents. 
So how do we do it? Well, we have a test. We have a way that can, that can be used to judge the historical credibility through questions that show whether something is reliable, whether something is trustworthy, whether something can accurately detail things that happened in an ancient time that we weren't able to be there for. These, ancient, these tests are used for all sorts of ancient writings. Homer's The Iliad and The Odyssey, Josephus' histories, as they discovered these documents, they asked these very same questions to find out, is this fictional? Is this real? Does this describe something that happened in history? Can we know more about it? And as they go through the test, they can rank something to say this is a pretty credible document, or that document right there has no credibility whatsoever. I'm not sure... I'm not sure that we should take anything from it. And so what I want to do this this evening is take just a little bit of time looking at some of these questions that historians ask. Now, I put all 10 of the common questions on your outlines. We're not going to look at all 10, but I encourage you to think through them. Because sometimes there is great, great evidences. Such as, and I forget which number it is, one of them says is the, is the authors of these documents, are they in a place to actually know anything? Josephus writing about the history of, of the Jews and of Rome, but having lived in the far-flung areas of China, they would say, he, this guy probably doesn't have the ability to know what he's writing about. But like, but like Michael wrote, excuse me, talked about in the Lord's Supper this morning, 1 John chapter 1 tells us a little something about the, the authors, at least one of the authors of the Gospel. And one thing we find is an answer to that question. Did they have the ability? Were they in a position to know something about the subject in which they wrote? Verse John 1.1, 1, 1, What was from the beginning we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at, what we have touched with our hands concerning the Word of life? Yeah, I think he was in a position to know a little something about what he was describing and what he was talking about. And so we're going to look at just a few of these questions and see how they show us some things about the reliability of of the scriptures. The first one we're going to look at is this one. Do we possess copies? Do we possess copies which are reasonably close to the originals? Now, what that means is what we have that the Bible has been translated off of, the translations that you're reading right now, those aren't the original writings of Paul. Paul very likely wrote very few of his letters. He probably had someone, he dictated that and somebody else recorded it. There are a few times where it seems as if he took the pen himself and signed his name or wrote some of the letter himself. But those, those autobiography or autographs, excuse me, those autographs, the original manuscripts, many of them have been lost, but they were copied. How many years pass between the copies and those original documents? That's important for historians to say, you know, if we're talking about something that's 2,000 years later, pretty likely that there, there's a lot of things that have happened between them to say, I'm not sure we can trust this. So do we possess copies that are reasonably close to the original? The Bible actually passes this question far better than most historical documents. Now, Michael, hold on to your seat. I've got a chart here. His inner, his inner account is like, woo, I knew I came here for a reason. <laughs> I want you to look at this. These are documents. Now, these zeros over here, I don't have... I don't have data for those, so we're going to ignore those for the moment. But these documents, the Gallic Wars, that's the writings of the Caesars, the Amosthenes, Euripides, Herodotus, these are ancient writings to which we have a great span of time between them. I want you to look, a thousand years, 1,300 years, 1,500 years. This is the, the span of time between when they were recorded and when we found those first copies, those, the first copies that we have of Plato show up, he's born and he's speaking in the 3 to 350 B.C., we don't find these, these copies of his writings for 1,200 years later, the earliest copy we have. My point in showing those is no historian looks at any of those and says they're not reliable. 1,500 years have passed, and people will still look at the writings of Euripides and say, there's, there's reason to believe what this guy wrote. That it says historically what was going on in the world around him. Now notice over at the New Testament. Fragments of the Gospel of John are found and our earliest copies of them date back to the mid-70s. 
just some 50 years. I mean, we have full copies of the entire New Testament within 300 years. You think 300 years is a long time, but it's not 1,500 years. And no one doubts the validity that these books can possess accurate knowledge of things that happened within them. In fact, these copies are so close to the original that if if this was any other document, there would be no reasonable doubt ever brought up towards the uh, credibility. Man, I want to say credulity. That's not even the right word. doesn't even fit there. Credibility of the document that we're talking about, our our Bibles. I'm going to give you some more, more interesting information here. This is the span of time between them. Okay, a thousand years between the writings of Caesar's Gallic Wars to when we have a copy that we have found, we can hold it in our hand and say, this is the copy of the original. A thousand years. But here's how many copies we have. 251. We have 440 copies of Demosthenes and Euripides, 330. You see, like the Iliad, we have a lot of those, 1,900 copies of that, but most of these are 500 and less. Pliny the Younger and, and Tacitus are, are people that have detailed great, great amounts of things that have happened in the Roman Empire. People look at those and go, we can trust what they say. They are incredibly, incredibly detailed uh, and trustworthy. And we only got seven copies of Pliny's. But we know it. Now the elephant in the room on the far end, the New Testament. We've got to go a ways. There we go. We have over 5,800 copies of just the New Testament. We take all the passages of Scripture combined. It's over 28,000 fragments, manuscripts, full books. We have an overwhelming amount. <coughs> Excuse me. An overwhelming amount of documents. And again, some of which date to within 50 years of the accounts that they are recording. <coughs> Do we have copies which are reasonably close to the originals. As I said, the Bible passes this better than almost any other book, any other ancient document. Yes, we pass this test marvelously. <clears throat> yeah, do you care? Yeah, thank you. The next question that I want us to consider is did the authors intend to convey reliable history to their readers? So if the author intends to tell a tale... To, to spin this great, magnificent yarn, yes, it may be a, a book that we know is, is real, and we may know that the author really exists, but we also know this author intended to tell us something fictional, to tell us something that just fantastic about what was going on in their mind that they have created. So is that what the, 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 the historians, when they come to the Bible... <clears throat> Thank you, Michael. That is one of the questions they ask is, did the authors intend to convey a reliable history to the readers? Well, let's let the authors tell us themselves. Look at Luke chapter 1 with me, verses 1 through 4. In Luke chapter 1, he records, since many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who were from the beginning, were eyewitnesses and servants of the Word, it seemed fitting to me as well having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in an orderly sequence, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. I just want you to key in on a few words here that Luke uses as he describes the beginning of his Gospel. First of all, he says, compiled. It has been taken, others have taken effort to compile. We are compiling data. Why are we storing up this data? To give an account of the things accomplished. These are things that have been done. These are things that literally happened amongst us. That is our purpose. But even as we go on, he says that there are eyewitnesses to these things. They have been investigated carefully. They are written so that you may know the exact truth. It does not take long as you start to examine the Bible and you get to that question, did the authors intend to convey something, uh, a reliable account of the history of their lives, of what was going on around them? You get to Luke, you can come to no other explanation. Yes! Very certain. That is the purpose of Luke. He wants the reader to know this is what happened exactly. Because we saw eyewitnesses 
the eyewitnesses saw it. They were able to be there and to, to walk with Him. As we read from John, they were able to talk with Him and to touch Him. Yes, this is purposefully written to record reliable history. The third question that we're going to look at this evening <clears throat> is the one that may surprise you a little bit. Is there self-damaging evidence or material in these documents? Now, you might think to yourself, well, certainly there should be no self-damaging material, but finding that within a document is incredibly important to historians. If we can find something in a document, first of all, if it doesn't have self-damaging material, we may still believe it as reliable and true, but if it does, it really takes things to a whole new level. It takes things to a whole new level because it shows motive. The people who are writing it were not writing with the purpose of just whitewashing facts. We're going to dress them up, make them look favorably for our purpose. No, the authors were intending to record the raw history. No matter how bad it looked, no matter how poorly it painted them, things didn't go good, things didn't look right, but this is what happened. So is there self-damaging material in the Bible? If you look in the Gospel of Mark, and just Mark alone, you're going to find lots of self-damaging material. In Mark chapter 3, verse 21, Jesus' own family and friends not only are embarrassed and have rejected Him, but they're telling the people around Him He's lost His mind. This Jesus of Nazareth is out of His senses. It doesn't look good. Why would we record that if we're trying to, to illustrate that this is the Son of God? In Mark chapter 6, verses 2-5, through five, His hometown rejects Him and it seems like it hinders His ability to perform miracles there because there was no faith found in them. Again, this is what we describe, this is what we define as, as historically accurate when we're, our motive is to just make this guy that we've picked out, Jesus of Nazareth, look the very best He possibly can. In Mark chapter 9, verse 18, the people that are following Jesus, His disciples... I have this, this meeting with a guy whose child is possessed by a demon, and they can't cast it out. They fail to cast it out. And when they ask Jesus, why couldn't we? His response is, did you pray? Something that would seem pretty important to a disciple of this Jesus, the Son of God. They would, certainly they would pray. Oh, you didn't? Wow, that doesn't look good either. That's pretty embarrassing. Mark chapter 9, verse 34. His disciples throughout the Gospels are depicted as hard-headed. They're fighting with one another. They're arguing with one another. In Mark chapter 14, one of Jesus' closest friends betrays Him, and a powerful figure amongst the followers of His, Peter, denies Him repeatedly. There is an incredible amount of self-damaging material recorded in these documents. If these Christians were trying to just simply fabricate these stories about Jesus and trying to make Him look as super and as amazing of a deity as they could, someone who has come from heaven, someone who possesses awesome, miraculous power, why include so many accounts of things not going well and of people not accepting Him? And again, things that just kind of seem a little bit embarrassing. The fact is, the Bible doesn't hide those moments. The Bible seems to push those out for the reader to see. And it lends to greater credibility to the, 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 in regard to the historicity and the trustworthiness of this document. Yes, there is fantastic self-damaging material in these documents. Now, the last one we're going to look at is probably the spot where the Bible does the worst in these series of questions meant to test its reliability. Are the recorded events believable? What this question does is it brings in what we started talking about, presuppositions, biases. It, it brings in a worldview again. If we can accept a worldview that allows for the occurrence of supernatural events, then this question the Bible actually scores much, much higher on, if not the highest possible. But if our, brain, if our worldview does not allow for that, then it's going to score far less. Let me give you an example. Is it believable that there is a God who created humanity? 
And if we can ascribe to that, if our worldview can allow that, is it believable that this God would desire to communicate with the creation that He has made? Is it believable that as Creator, God would have the power to impact and to influence events in the world that He made? Is it believable that this God could reign as sovereign? Again, that's going to... It's going to depend on how your worldview, how your biases and presuppositions allow you to believe. If it's not believable, if you come to this conclusion that that is absolutely not believable whatsoever, then what alternatives can we suggest? What alternatives exist that are more believable than that? The answers to those questions, again, they reveal our biases. But accepting supernatural origins and actions or purely just only accepting natural processes alone, we have to come to the conclusion to this answer. Is the Bible believable? As I said, this is one of those places where the Bible does seem, seems to fail in the, in the eyes of many others. But with a worldview that can accept, with a, a mind, a, a philosophy that says, I believe that supernatural things can happen, And seeing that He is the God who literally, with His mouth, you know, to be there. When His words drew galaxies out of nothing. When He called the mountains up from the deep. If I can believe that God created all of this, if I, can, if I can have a worldview that will allow that, then the Bible is incredibly believable. In fact, it's one of the most believable documents the world has ever seen. As I said, there are several other questions, several other questions that we could go to to assist in discovering the trustworthiness of the Bible. We're not going to look at those tonight. I encourage you, take those and, and examine them yourself. Find out if there's an answer to those questions that makes the Bible more trustworthy or less trustworthy so that you can be prepared to answer those questions for someone someday. But let's end by thinking of one more question. If the Bible has proven itself to be trustworthy, and again, out of all of these ancient documents that we've looked at, repeatedly the Bible scores very, very high on this series of of questions that historians have come up with. If the Bible has proven itself to be trustworthy, why haven't its opponents tried to falsify its accounts? This isn't a question that historians ask, but it's a question that is sometimes raised up in defense of the Bible being the true, trustworthy Word of God, detailing things that happened in the first century and before. Why haven't opponents tried to falsify its accounts? So I want you to take yourself back for a moment to the first century. And opponents are trying to falsify, not necessarily the account of the Bible, but the reliability and the purity of the image of Christ, and especially of those who follow Him. In the time of the first century, the second century, Christians are, are spreading, they are growing, they are telling other people about the good news of Jesus Christ. It is causing the world to be turned upside down. People are responding to that. People are persecuting them for that. And terrible, terrible rumors start to occur, especially around the ends of the second century. There are rumors of Christians that are involved in these twisted rituals which involved killing and eating infants. Terrible as that sounds, the reason that this, ritual, that this rumor began is because in the days of Rome, as one Roman historian has described, we have wives for raising babies, we have mistress, mistresses for pleasure. But raising children was not often desirable. And so in Roman culture, if you had a child and you didn't want it, you found a field far enough away from town that it wasn't going to be a bother, and you left this newborn infant in the elements for whatever to happen. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, 
to visit orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Christians that heard this, Christians that believed this, would notoriously walk the fields around the cities of Rome looking for infants that had been left, that had no care, that had no love, that were in distress so that they could take them and raise them as their own. And yeah, that garnered a bad reputation from the world around them. These people, what are they doing with all these babies? Who would want this? Who would do that? People tried to falsify the character. But why didn't people try to falsify the document? So go back a little bit further to Acts chapter 2 in your minds. And Peter is standing before a group of Jews who have not long ago crucified this Jesus of Nazareth. And as he stands before thousands and thousands of Jews on Pentecost, he makes this bold claim. Verse 32, This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. And a cry comes out from the crowd. No, He didn't. Here's the body. You've made all this up. This is complete fabrication. He is dead. We have got His body here to prove it. There is the tomb. We can all go there and see. But that's not what happens. What happens is people stand silently as they hear Peter proclaiming the truth of what God has done in the midst of this people and no one can deny it. When he says, Jesus who is in your midst performing powerful miracles, and then a voice cries up and says, Jesus who? We've never heard of this guy. But no, that's not what happened. Because He had been in their midst and every one of them was an eyewitness to the things that He had done. If there was ever a time to say this that you're talking about, what you're recording, is completely fabricated, it's at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And all of the critics' mouths are shut because they know this guy that he's talking about is the guy we have had crucified. And he's telling us, that He is raised again, and that He was in fact the Son of God. If there was ever a time to discredit, it was then. And the Bible's message was reliable. It could be trusted then. My friends, it can be trusted now. Not only is the answer yes, the Bible can be trusted. The answer is if there was ever a document that could ever be trusted, it is this. The recorded Word of of God has given us ample reason to trust. And so I want to encourage you to share with me then in a trustworthy passage. If this is the trustworthy Word of God and we can trust the Bible, let's turn together over to Romans chapter 8. We're going to go a few few verses prior to what Brother Ron read for us at the beginning of services. Go back to verse 1. A trustworthy passage from a trustworthy document. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us We do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. You can trust the promise of God. That's a trustworthy statement. You can trust that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You can trust that God sent His Son as an offering for our sin, for those who are in Christ, those who are walking in the Spirit, our requirements are filled. Promise of God. How do you get into Christ? If, that's, if I can trust that statement and I can trust that I can have the requirements for my life filled in Him, how do I get into Him? Again, a trustworthy statement. Romans chapter 6, verse 3. All of you who have been baptized into Christ have been put on Christ. But he goes on to tell us there that this new life that we are living is a life that is, that is changed. It is by the glory which raised Jesus from the dead. The glory of the Father. 
Our old self has died. Our sinful way of walking has died. Our walking in the flesh has died. Sexual immorality and lying and gossip and pride and hate. We're laying that at the cross because we trust in the God who said, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. We trust that when He said there's no condemnation in Jesus Christ, He meant it. We trust that when He said, I am coming again. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. I am the way, the truth, and the life. We trust because time and time again, it is proven to be a trustworthy document. Let us turn to the God that we can trust together. If that would be your desire this evening, it would be our desire to assist you with that. Can we just talk about that together? If so, come